Man, June, good to see you. Miles, come on. There are handouts over here. There's simple, you know, on both sides of the paper. And when we run out of those, there's two-sided ones here for the handout. So, but June, you may want to get the handout. So, yeah. Thank you, Greg. All right. So, uh, tonight, we are, and, and by the way, if, I think we're about to broadcast or broadcasting just starting now. Great to have you if you're watching the live stream online or later catching this study. This is, we're going to do a biblical study for two or three Wednesdays uh, for our summer Wednesday study to start off in June on, I've just titled it, No Greater Love. And that's a quotation from Jesus. We're not going to get to that quotation tonight. We're going to, we'll get there next week, okay? Uh, we'll get more into the New Testament next week, although I am going to begin with some overview from the New Testament. No greater love following Jesus in true friendship. So this is part one tonight. And uh, the reason we're doing this study is... I was prompted, as I mentioned earlier, by the fact that Dean said we're going to do a six or seven part series with the youth this summer, both with the junior high at their level and with the high school students at their level. I mean, the conversation range will be different <laughs> with sixth graders and with 10th and 11th graders, okay? But they're doing a series on friendship and the importance of friendship. And certainly for all of our parents and even grandparents, you know the importance of friendships for our children, for our teenagers, for our young adults, actually for our 55 and 85-year-olds. It makes a big difference whom you hang out with. It makes a huge difference. And sometimes a little bit to the horror of parents and grandparents. We know this, don't we? Friends become more influential than parents at various points and junctures of decision-making and stages of the lives of, our, of folks in our family. So, uh, and unfortunately, sometimes even a friend can be more influential than a spouse on decision-making about what happens to a, to a couple and a household's finances, you know, job decisions, all kinds of things like that. So, uh, the Bible and God's word are quite cognizant of this, the Bible actually calls us to embrace true friendship and to understand friendship as essential to vibrant and healthy faith and fruitfulness. So we'll kind of develop some of that. Uh, one of the things that unfortunately is the case in our world is that friendship is, um, like all things in the fallen world, distorted and perverted. And, and we also have a tendency, certainly in, in the late modern age and now in the postmodern age, uh, as we've moved into the 21st century, of flattening everything out and assuming that any kind of serious attraction or passion must relate to sex or gender identification or perhaps you know, rabid politics, for instance. So, so, in other words, uh, but, but that's not going to be the case we're going to find out from God's Word. So we'll, we'll take a look at this uh, over the next few weeks. And actually, I, I welcome this. It connects. It's going to connect with, you'll hear me saying this on Sundays, with Jesus' continuing development of his disciples as we move our way through the gospel according to Luke. And we're, we're at the stage, and... I think I may spend two or three Sundays on this, where Jesus selects his apostles from among his disciples. And there's maybe, although it's just a few verses, there's maybe a lot we can look at on Sunday mornings, and it's going to connect with this study. But again, for me, I kind of welcome this study because, to be honest, I'm doing this study on Wednesday night, at least for these Wednesdays in June, simply prompted by the fact that our youth are studying the issue of friendship and how... Uh, biblical and deep-rooted faith friendships are important. Okay, so let's start off with one of the classic verses. We'll look at a number of verses from Proverbs. You've heard me preach and teach from these before, but let's, let's go through these. Uh, you, most of you will know most of these verses quite well, but I think it's helpful to go through these. Proverbs 
chapter 17, verse 17. You see, I've got it highlighted to begin with. A friend loves at all time, and a brother is born for adversity. Now, now this is a, this is a coupling here that we also often see in the Proverbs. Sometimes it's two different verses. In this case, this is a compact coupling where you've got the idea that a friend, you put a friend, so to speak, alongside brother. You see those two terms? And the idea here is that a real friend is going to be like a brother. And the concept of the brother in this verse pretty clearly extends not just to a familial brother, but somebody who is, you know, united with you in cause, in commitment. So in other words, it's not just somebody from your own biological family. Got it? So that's the, that's the idea here. And it's very New Testament oriented. It's going to point us towards the New Testament because Jesus is going to tell us repeatedly, and being a Christian means embracing one another as brothers and sisters, even though we're not from the same biological family. Jesus you know, teaches us to pray to our Father in heaven and at the horizontal level relate to each other as brothers and sisters. So uh, to be someone who loves at all time. You mean even when they've been bad to me? Yes. You mean even when they've let me down? Yes, see that? That's the concept, you, you immediately get pushed on this, right? And in the church, in the church, in the household of God through Jesus, Jesus is clearly teaching this over and over again. He's got it, you know, just grounded into and fused into our DNA as Christians. This is the way he teaches us to, to, to pray and to relate to each other. If, if, you know, if we've got a concern or problem with a brother or sister, Jesus says immediately, you're supposed to go to that brother or sister. You, know, you, don't, you don't go to the courts. You don't make a big public appeal. You don't shame them. You go and relate to them directly, whether it's a little thing or a big thing. But that's an example of the way we're supposed to model this. We're supposed to stick with each other, lay down our lives for each other. But I'm getting my, ahead of myself because that's kind of more for next week. That's New Testament stuff. Now, uh, let's look at some of these passages. Just work through them. Proverbs uh, 13, verse 20. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Now, you don't need to be a deep biblical scholar to get that one, do you? But that's a verse to remember. That's a verse, certainly, we want our 15-year-olds to know, but we also want our 45 and our 85-year-olds to know that one, too. <laughs> Whoever walks with the wise, and of course the idea here is that you are not only with them, but you're heading in the same direction, right? If I'm with somebody, I tend to move in the same direction, right? It's not be really dangerous. That's why walking with Jesus, where does Jesus end up? What is Jesus' destination? You know, heaven, right? Being with God. So it's really good for me to follow Jesus and walk with Jesus because I know his destination is going to be really good. But if you walk with a fool, you're heading towards destruction. It's going to be great. This cliff is really exciting to jump off. <laughs> Come on, take another step with me. Probably not a good idea. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. It's guaranteed. It's going to happen sooner or later. Um, and a fool, of course, as you remember in the Proverbs, is somebody who uh, does not fear the Lord, denies the Lord's existence, or denies the Lord's power and law, and uh, thinks he knows everything. A fool always thinks he knows everything. He's a lot smarter. He's smarter than God and all that Bible stuff, and he's smarter than the goody-goody people. That's a fool, okay? Uh, he's wise in his own eyes. So anyway, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. This is Proverbs 27.6. And this is one of these, it, we'll get several of these passages that press us a little bit to understand, wait a minute, if a friend wounds me saying that I've done wrong or that I need to rethink 
or that um, you know I need to step this way instead of that way my immediate reaction in the flesh may be I don't want you as a friend anymore I'm really mad at you you're questioning what I'm doing you've hurt me but according to this verse wounds that come from a friend are faithful whereas the kisses and flattery of somebody who is acting like they're your friend but is actually trying to take you down or trying to manipulate you that's what you got to be worried about so even if it's a friend who fails you let's look at it this way in the garden is it simon peter who's going to fail jesus or is it judas who kisses jesus who's the real friend i mean simon peter lets jesus down but he really loves jesus judas kisses jesus does, does he love jesus no okay all right so uh got to remember that and, and if we're if we're hungry and we crave flattery we can fail the message of this verse pretty easily okay so oil and perfume make the heart glad so a man's counsel is sweet to his friend the, those, these verses obviously of course go together here and they're from that sequence in proverbs 27. the idea is it, it you should welcome the counsel even the hard counsel of a friend it should smell as good to you as great perfume that's what that just said okay now um, make no friendship with a man and of course this applies to a woman also uh, given to anger nor go with a wrathful man lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare so this is telling you not to befriend or stay friends with somebody who is a person of anger. That el immediately eliminates a whole lot of people from your friendship possibilities. Just gotta warn you on that. You can pray for them, pray that God will, you know, heal them and bring them to repentance and conviction about their anger. And maybe you can be a friend in the future, but you're not supposed to hang out with a person of anger. Um, do not be misled. This is Paul in the New Testament. You've heard this from me before. Bad company corrupts good character. It's guaranteed. This is in the New Testament. This is not in the Old Testament. This is in the New Testament. It's guaranteed. You hang around with bad company and your character is going to be taken down. It's going to be polluted. It's just guaranteed. Um, and of course, famously, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Should we evangelize? Should we reach out? Jesus himself, you know, fellowships with toll collectors and sinners. Uh, two notes on that. Jesus may be a little more developed than some of us are. So, he, uh, you know, we may should uh, guard a little bit about the level and the length of how much we hang out with the you know, known public sinners. The other thing too is the fact that in those cases, those sinners are hanging out with Jesus is they're coming to him in submission and repentance and, and, and subjecting themselves to his teaching. That's what's going on when he reclines at table with them. So that's New Testament stuff, but just a note on that. Now, um, iron sharpens iron. Everybody knows this verse, right? Iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens another. Again, from that sequence in Proverbs 27. Two are better than one because they share a good return for their labor. For if either of them fails, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Also, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, this is from Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. And you'll notice several things going on here. There is a warning and actually language of curse against someone who would call themselves a person of faith, but who does not have faithful friends. 
It's a warning and at one level a curse. I mean, to propose that you are a person of faith but not have a, a friend, one or more friends who have your back and who believe the same way you do is wrong. Jesus never tells Simon Peter, great, you finally understand who I am. Get, you know, get yourself far away from all these other guys. I want you to go off and, you know, succeed on your, on your own. Never happens. Show me that in the New Testament. It's not going to happen. So the Bible is telling us we are called to make friendships. And that this is a blessing and a gift from God to grow in friendship with one another. Good? Okay. So, um, on the other hand, that does not mean we're supposed to have a whole bunch of friends who are not faithful. <laughs> so, let's go to the next passage. A man of many companions may come to ruin. And, by the way, a, a man or a woman who has a thousand friends on Facebook may come to ruin. <laughs> Facebook friends do not guarantee you. Um, you know, uh, God's blessings. However, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, there you see that tension with the friend and the brother, and you're going to see this in the next verse, too, that where Proverbs is pushing us is the idea that a true friend is better than a brother. That even though blood runs deep, that spiritual brotherhood should and will run deeper if we truly have spiritual brothers and sisters. That's both an exciting good news message and it's also kind of challenging to us. So let's just continue with this now. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Just a couple notes on that passage. That is, it can be read exactly as it stands I do not read that verse as clearly prophetic of Jesus. It certainly can be read, and we're going to see in the New Testament, to kind of link back with the New Testament. But this is really talking more at the level that I just mentioned. That, that, that's what's going on with the writer of this proverb. So, do not forsake your friend and your father's friend. You know, like, we're supposed to be, this is the it's an interesting kind of family thing. This is, I think this verse is assuming that the father is a man of faith also. So, don't forsake your friend or your father's faithful friend. And do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity. Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. And that's speaking, I think, both literally and also kind of metaphorically or spiritually. In other words, um, when you get in trouble, if you've got a friend who always has your back and is always faithful, you should go to him instead of to a, rel uh, you know, a familiar relative who actually doesn't spend much time with you or on you. Any questions on that? Does this make, does this make sense as wisdom to you? I mean, somebody who's always sticking with you, who prays with you, who has your back, that person is actually more valuable to you than a brother who calls you, you know, once a week and says, hey, I hope everything's going okay. How are the kids? That's what this just said. Um, okay, now, that's the, so those are some passages from the Bible on the importance of friendship, both negatively you can make some really bad friendship decisions, and positively. Okay, now let's go to, um, this is going to bridge us over into the New Testament, and this picks up on the whole friendship thing. There are seven or eight love words in Greek, which is the language of the New Testament. Now, this is not a tutorial on all these words, and we're not learning Greek tonight that much, but it is kind of helpful to get a little bit of an overview. So we're going to look at, at these seven or eight love words from Greek, which then parlays into the fact that we've got the New Testament, 
which highlights a few of these verbs, okay, and then, um, or in nouns, verbs and nouns, and then C.S. Lewis's famous book, The Four Loves. So I'm gonna just kind of fuse some of this together. So uh, first of all, you have, in the Greeks, by the way, a lot of languages, including Hebrew, is not diverse and variegated on the love language. In fact, English is not either. Y'all know this, right? We use love in about 18 different ways and it means 18 different stuff. You know, you, you can love banana pudding and you can love your wife. And I hope those aren't at the same level, but you use the same verb, right? <laughs> you, you can say, I love some pop singer and also say, I love my wife. And somebody would be saying like, are you, are you having an adulterous affair? You know, so like lay off some of this, or maybe you need to clarify some of this love language, but you know, the, the English language is not, interestingly enough, because we got a ton of words in the English language, but the love thing, there's not a lot of variation there. Well, the Greeks had variation. You know, they're pretty sophisticated over time. So they have uh, seven words that mean love and, and another one that sometimes is used. A storge, which is familial love, okay? But it's not just family love. It does include family love. Uh, it also includes attachment to whoever or whatever is familiar, okay? You, you develop storge for your family cat or dog, okay? And you, you, you love your dog more than the dog that lives down the street. Most likely, I hope you do, you know, if you got a dog. Um, then it also includes love of kin, love of tribe, and love of country, what we call patriotism. Now, as you can hear, these things can be good or they can be bad. I mean, this kind of love can be helpful or if taken to an extreme, it can be problematic. Um, you know, uh, there are lots of Nazis who were highly patriotic in the 1930s. Didn't turn out that well those kind of things. So, you, you, yeah, you need to have checks on some of these loves, but that's storge. Um, philatia is love of self. This is, an, hey, at a certain level, maybe this is okay. You certainly don't want to be hating yourself, but if you take this out of proportion, you can end up over like Narcissus, you know, in Greek mythology, and be narcissistic. Not a good thing. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on some of these because they're not highlighted in the New Testament so much. Certainly the themes are, but the words are not so much. Um, philia. This, of course, you know, is brotherly, friendship kind of love. Obviously, we're emphasizing this one tonight. We'll come back to this. Um, then you've got uh, ludus, which is playful love and potentially fleeting love. This could be like, you know, the 13-year-old girl who has the crush on the 14-year-old boy for one week. This can be infatuation. This can be flirting. Flirting, okay? And playful kind of love. It, a lot of times, you know, summer love. Okay, summer love. Kids go off to camp and for one week they're in love and then they come back home and they forget each other's names. You know, that kind of thing. You know, it's playful love. Um, you don't want to bank your eternal destination on, on this one, believe me. Okay. So, um, and then of course we're going to move on to eros, which is romantic love or sexually passionate love. You know the word erotic. So this comes from this, uh, eros. So then, of course, we have mania, or what we would call mania. Does anybody have any questions on if this one might be a little bit out of kilter? You know, so uh, this, is, this is obsessive love. You don't want anyone being this kind of loving towards you. This is, this is not good. Parents don't want to be 
maniacally loving towards their kids. Um, pragma, which is not technically a love term, but sometimes it gets kind of clumped in. Uh, dutiful action, making it work, you know, making things work, long-term commitment. Uh, some people marry for pragmatic purposes. Then you have agape. And this is selfless love. So let's, let's kind of drill down with the New Testament and with Lewis's um, exploration of the, some of these Greek terms and the New Testament. Storge is the empathy bond. Now, storge includes need love. For instance, a baby, an infant, comes to love and become attached to his or her mom. That's not a mature love. That's a need love. At a certain level, we continue in the need love mode throughout all our lives, right? And need love is, if, if, it's, if a love is driven mainly by our need, that's going to be the flip, of course, of agape. It's, it's, and it's not, it's not really godly so much. Okay? Um, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, God designed us like this, but it's just like a, a two-year-old's love for the parents is not a deep, mature, you know, God the Father level love kind of thing. Okay. Uh, a dog likes the hand that feeds him. Is that a, you know, Jesus level love? No. <laughs> So that's, that's uh, you know, storge kind of includes some of that. Um, and, of course, mutual spousal love. In many marriages, that's what you're looking at, storge. That's what you're looking at. That's the level you're looking at. We have needs. You do for me, I do for you. Kind of works out. And I've stuck with you all these years. That's who we are. We had eros, you know, the first three months we were together, and now we're in storge mode. That can happen with marriages, right? I'm not, this is not a marital counseling session. I'm just saying that's reality. Um, Philea or philia. This is the deep friendship bond. And now these are quotes from Lewis, C.S. Lewis. The least biological, organic, instinctive, gregarious, and necessary, the least natural of the loves is this, make this deep friendship thing. Uh, we don't need friendship in order to reproduce, but to the classical and medieval worlds, it is a higher level love because it is freely chosen. Right? It's not, you, you don't choose, I guess you do at some level to love your kid, but if you're, let's just put it this way, if you're a half decent parent, you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna love your child. This is a, a much bigger choice here. Um, to the ancients, friendship, this is Lewis now, friendship seemed the happiest and most fully human of all loves, the crown of life and the school of virtue. To the modern world in comparison, the modern world in comparison ignores it. The idea that the ancients and even medieval people had about how important your friendship network was and how developing deep friendships in our world and this is Lewis talking in the middle of the well he wrote this book in 1960 but roughly the middle of the 20th century and certainly in the 21st century we don't value the kind of friendship that they're talking about here with this kind of verb okay um, eros romantic love this is being in love loving someone Lewis distinguishes this from eros really is not the raw, you know, sexual lust thing. Uh, Lewis is highlighting the fact that for the Greeks and certainly, um, you know, to the, to the extent it, it's rough, it's generally vaguely referred to in the New Testament, it's going to be romantic love more so than just passionate lust for one night. That's not what eros is really talking about. Um, agape, this is in the New Testament, hands down, the highest level love. But we're gonna come back to this because what, I, what we see and what I see in the New Testament is Jesus is kind of, in a way, pairing um, the phileo love, the 
brotherly friendship love at a high level with agape, selfless, unconditional love. So anyway, it's unconditional, selfless, godly love. It's gift love. And in Old English, we did have a different name for this. Y'all remember this, right? It comes from the Greek kairotos, gift, right? And so like if you read Old King James, when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it doesn't say love, it says charity. Does some of y'all remember that? It says charity. We think of charity as something totally different, you know, helping out those in need or whatever. This is gift love is what's being said in the Old English. For whatever reason, we lost that. Anyway, that's what that's talking about. Um, Lewis says, what draws people to be friends is that they see the same truth and they share it. So in other words, we have a vision and a moral clarity about what's true and what we should strive for that's united and that unites us. That's a really cool thing. And, and of course, that pertains to us as Christians. What he's really talking about is what it means to be a Christian. We will, as Christians, we will forsake our own family household and biological family to be faithful to Christ and the gospel truth. Jesus says, if you, don't, if you will not do that, you're not worthy of me. We'll, we'll hit that in Luke. We're, we're going to hit that in Luke. Does that challenge anybody in the room? Does that challenge anybody online? It probably should because it's not the way we normally think. But that's what Jesus calls us to. That's, that's what we're talking about with the high level of faith friendship. Now, I'm going to go ahead, page two, I'm going to go ahead and deal with uh, the David issue a little bit because David and Jonathan seems to be, um, you know, the last 30, 40 years, there's been a whole lot written um, by uh, progressive theologians, interpreters, preachers, etc., about how David and Jonathan are obviously, come on people, give me a break, they say, um, you know, gay or bisexual, you know, lovers. Uh, the, our answer is going to be actually not, that's not the case, but let's go through some of the scripture and look at um, what, and what I want to give you is the scripture. What happens is a verse or a line will typically be cherry picked and put into a, a much larger article. I think it's helpful to remember where these passages come. I've, uh, I, I've bolded some of the key typical verses that are highlighted in these discussions. So I'm gonna give you a little bit larger scope of what we're looking at. Now, David, uh, at the beginning of what we call 2 Samuel, you know, in the Hebrew Bible, it's all one book, okay? Um, at the beginning of what we call 2 Samuel, David gets the news that Saul and Saul's son, Jonathan, who is David's, like in some ways, David's best friend, Jonathan, uh, have been killed. And so David goes in this lament, and he's in, in the midst of this, he says, I am distressed for you, my brother, Jonathan. Now, you notice he uses the term brother. You see that? Uh, is Jonathan his actual, is, is, is Jonathan an, a ninth son of Jesse? No, no. But he's using that term, which I've already introduced to you in the Bible, is a big term that emphasizes being one in faithfulness, okay? Uh, I am distressed for you, my brother, Jonathan. Um, notice he does not say my lover, my beloved, or anything like that. He said my brother. Um, Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love, now the term there is um, ahava, okay? And the, the love verbs that David and Jonathan, are going to be used in connection with David and Jonathan, is ahav. Okay, that Hebrew is like English. That is a big, wide-ranging verb set. Okay, it can mean all kinds of things. Um, however, yada da, yada uh, is used when you're talking about love that is actuated in sexual actions. That that verb 
is never used in connection with David and Jonathan. So these, what I'm gonna tell you is these, these verses and, 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 and this whole conversation kind of becomes a Rorschach test. So in other words, there, you can read this different ways, but if you start reading it in a way that is beyond what the Bible says, I think it's showing where the person reading it is coming from more than it's telling you about the Bible. Do you all understand what I'm saying? In other words, people read things into the Bible, okay? And the way they read into the Bible tells you what they're, that they have a big agenda, okay? So anyway, um, the term there is the broad term for love. That term is um, never used for explicit sexual activity love. Okay, it's never used for, in other words, eros type of activity. Okay, just not. Um, it is a broad term for love. And, and it's sometimes used for the way a man loves a woman, but not in the sense of sexually. Do y'all, do y'all hear the difference that I'm making here, the distinction? Okay, all right. So, um, your love to me, Ahava, was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. Now, that can mean all kinds of things. Just let me tell you, because that can be, that, the love of women could be um, what women love, the way women have loved me, the way I love women, that, that in itself can be interpreted different angles. Everybody with me on this? If you're watching online and have a question about this, call me later or, or email me later. But, but uh, I'm just saying that on its face can be translated or interpreted different ways. But let's just go back to, okay, David is in battle mode. Jonathan has been killed in battle. If you were in the army, in battle, and you saw a guy crying over a comrade, news that a comrade had been killed in battle, and he said, your love for me was greater even than a woman's, would you immediately think, oh, they were gay lovers? If you were watching a war movie, and you know you see one of the heroes crying because one of the other one died, and he said, you know what? You were special to me. You were the most special one. Would you immediately assume, like that John Wayne in the movie had, had a homoerotic relationship? No, no, that's the way people talk in crisis and grief situations, right? See, the, the thing that's happened, though, unfortunately, in our culture is there's, there's certain people who want to read into any situation, oh, obviously, this is what's going on. Obviously, John Wayne, uh, when he said, this guy, I was closer to this guy than I was to my girlfriend. Well, that just means that, no, that does not mean that. Everybody understand this? Okay, so anyway, that's, so I'm showing you the context of what's going on here. Now, let's keep going. Uh, I, uh, by the way, we're going to get to early chapter 18 of 1 Samuel, but I want you to understand what's happened in the, in the context. When David is going to take on Goliath, this is in 1 Samuel 17. You remember David shows up and he's willing to fight the Philistine giant Goliath. Pick up here now. Then Saul, this is verse 38, clothed David with his armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. And David strapped on his, this is now Saul, King Saul. Remember, King Saul is a head taller than any other Israelite. And David is not tall, okay? Saul is a big man. And David's trying to put on his armor because Saul wants him to. He's like, look, you're going to be our, you know, we don't have a lot of armor, but I have, a, I have the full set and I'm going to give you mine. But by the way, of course, who's the one who's actually supposed to be fighting Goliath? Who's the one who's a head taller than all the Israelites, and they've chosen him to be their champion? Saul. Okay. Anyway, so Saul, Saul's putting his, his stuff on David. And David strapped on his sword over his military attire and struggled at walking, for he was not trained with the armor. 
So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these because I not, have not trained with them. And David took them off. So you get this picture, right? David takes off Saul's clothes. And he takes off his armor. And he rejects his sword. And so David, dressed down just like he normally is, like a shepherd boy, is going to go out with a sling and five stones and take on that giant who's just covered in serpentine armor, looking like Satan himself. I mean, he, he looks like a snake. It's scaly armor. That's the way the Bible describes it. <laughs> so obviously, David's going to get killed, right? Is that what happens? No. David has refused Saul's covering. Okay, you know, you have to remember this because I'm telling you, what I read in some of these articles, they just cherry pick like one verse and they, they don't keep you with what's actually going on. Okay, so now let's pick up the story. You remember, of course, David does kill Goliath. Everybody remembers this, right? So now let's move ahead. So when David returned from killing the Philistine, that means Goliath, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the Philistine's head in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Um, and now it came to pass, this is verse 1, this one usually gets highlighted. Now it came about, came to pass, when he had finished speaking to Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him, loved David, as he loved himself. Now, this is, this is a classic Rorschach test, you know, kind of verse, because, you know, on its face, obviously what it's saying is Jonathan is just struck with this guy who has taken out the giant who was threatening Israel's existence, and he feels like they're brothers, you know? Their souls are knit together. When, when Jonathan hears how humble David is after, like, you know, David doesn't come in saying, you know, hey, I'm the dude or whatever. There's something about David that, that Jonathan just feels like this is my true brother. And so their souls are united together. Now, notice it does not say their bodies are united together. It say this their souls are united together. All right, now let's keep going. And Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Now, notice that's, that's Saul who does this. Saul's going to keep David both because he wants him to work for him and also because David would be honestly, Saul is a manipulative dude and he's a political dude. And he understands if he lets David go back to Bethlehem after being the big hero in Israel's history, he could have a threat on his hands. So he's gonna keep him close. Y'all understand that's what's going on, right? Okay, so um, then Jonathan cut, uh, this is gonna be cut, okay, this is Berit language. Then Jonathan cut a covenant with David, made a covenant with David, because he loved him as his own soul. We already know that. He loved him as his own soul. And look at this now. This, is the, this, is, this verse gets, gets a whole lot of play now. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. So Jonathan is saying, we're one and I'm going to go ahead and concede to you. You, you are the leader. You know, you're, you're Batman. I'm going to be Robin. That seems to be what he's saying here. And he's also saying, you can have anything I have. There's, there's no, I'm not keeping anything from you. And notice the contrast here. The reason I gave you those verses from right before David fights Goliath in this case is to show you the contrast here, which the biblical writer is clearly making that David accepts accepts the exchange from Jonathan, whereas Saul, Saul's exchange did not work for him. Y'all see the contrast there, right? It's pretty obvious. Um, so David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. And Saul set him over the men of war. And it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Now, this is fast forwarding. This is after Saul's, you know, Saul, Saul's thrown his spear at David. You know, the spirit of the Lord has departed. Saul now has an evil spirit. He wants to kill David. David's out, you know, run out 
to save his life. And pick up in this story now. We're moved ahead to chapter 20. And as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. And they, this is David and Jonathan, kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. This is telling you that David is heartbroken over that Saul has rejected him, that they cannot be together, that he, he is being basically Saul is going to kill him, so he can't continue to stay and support the kingdom and the household of Saul. David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace, because we have sworn both of us in the name of Yahweh, in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. That's 1 Samuel 20, verses 41 and 42. Okay, now let's break down a few things here. I've already introduced this concept of love. Uh, Jonathan does love David. The way I read this, clearly on the intention of the Bible here, and under the whole counsel of God, is Jonathan loves David in a, not only a, a, a phileo way, but also a agape agape way. He's willing to sacrifice himself, which is, we're, we're being shown this. This is the way we're all supposed to, if we're reading this, supposed to respond to David. David's the anointed of God. Uh, now, but some other people love David, including Saul. Saul loves David. We are told that in 1 Samuel 16. Do you think that Saul and David had an amorous relationship? What do you think? No. Um, all Israel, did David have an amorous relationship with everybody who lived in Israel? What do you think? No. Um, Michal, that's, that's Saul's daughter, whom Saul gives to David in marriage. She loved David. And let me just note, David has a whole lot of women that he hangs out with the entire books of First and Second Samuel, like all the time. And, of course, I'll come back to um, Bathsheba in a minute. Um, you know, that, that, is, that does not seem like the move of a guy who's confused sexually. He's, he is confused. He's, he's going to commit big sins sexually, but he's not confused on his sexual orientation, let's put it that way. Um, and all of Saul's servants, did David have relationships with all of Saul's servants? What do you think? No. Um, let's go to the rest of it. Notice that Jonathan and Saul kissed each other. Don Corleone in the Godfather movie, if you've ever watched that movie, kisses a whole bunch of people. Do you, would you go up to Don Corleone and say, oh, you must obviously be in relationships with these people? You'd get killed immediately, right? This is, Don, this is, way, this is the way people work in the Mediterranean world. Y'all know this, right? In the Mediterranean, people kiss each other. <laughs> Men kiss each other, including sometimes they kiss you before they kill you. I mean, it's, it's not, it doesn't always mean the greatest thing that somebody's giving you a kiss. Um, Esau kissed his brother Jacob. You remember how Esau hated Jacob for a long time, and then he takes him back, you know, lets him come back? But believe me, these brothers are not in some kind of relationship here. Um, Joseph kissed all his brothers. Remember the ones who sold him into slavery when they're down in Egypt? He kisses all of them. Um, Jacob kissed his grandsons. Um, Joseph kissed his dead father. I, never, I have not yet read the articles that say that there, there was something going on there. Um, but please, if you're watching online, don't get an idea from me. I'm not proposing that at all. Uh, do not go in that direction, please. Uh, Moses kissed his brother Aaron and his father-in-law Jethro. Samuel kissed Saul. Samuel doesn't like Saul. Absalom kissed everyone who approached him. And David kissed old uh, Barzillai. Nobody's ever proposed yet that I've read that, you know, old Barzillai, the old man, and, you know, David just kisses him, right? This is what they do. This is what they do in the society. In the New Testament, we are called to give the kiss of affection to all of our brothers and sisters in the church. I haven't preached heavily on that yet. Maybe we should start doing that more. It is in the Bible. But believe me, that would not mean that we're all in some kind of relationship together. 
Um, so what do we see from this? Well, as far as, I mean, now I'm, I'm moving on from, I hope that I have convinced you that it is an overstressed, overstretching uh, move to make biblically to say, oh, let me come back to this too. In the Old Testament law, homosexual activity is clearly a sin punishable by death. Murder is clearly a sin punishable by death. Adultery is a sin punishable by death. When David commits his sins in his relationship with Bathsheba, committing adultery with Bathsheba, it's like double adultery because it's against his own wives and against uh, Uriah the Hittite as well, and then has Uriah the Hittite killed. Does God flinch from condemning David for that? No. So it would be strange if homosexual activity is a sin under the law that God says, well, we're not going to worry about David on this one. But then later slaps him down because of the adultery and the murder. See what I'm saying? And, and to propose that the writer of Samuel is covering up for David there, but not, it just doesn't make sense. It's not logical. That's another point on this. Okay, now I'm moving on. Nobody here has any further questions on this, do you? Everybody good on this? Okay, now, um, what I think we have here are examples of, and we may come back to this briefly next time. I see in the David and Jonathan account a powerful prophecy and prophetic typing of Jesus' relationship with us as disciples. For instance, the way that I can come before the throne of the king, that is before God the Father, is not in my own rags of human righteousness. Everybody remember this from the New Testament? How do I come before God? I'm robed in somebody else's clothes. I'm robed in the righteousness of Christ. Do you remember this? This is the New Testament. Well, this story about this exchange going on with Jonathan and David seems to be a prophetic type pointing us to what's happening there. In other words, I'm going to have to be united with Jesus so much that he and I are one, and he's willing to give me and give you his robe of righteousness so that we might live in the kingdom. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That's what's really being said here, I think, at the deep level. Um, these are also, of course, examples of what we're gonna see develop further in the New Testament of brotherly love rising to the level of agape love, selfless love, sacrificial love. I sacrifice myself and my own rights and look to you as better than myself. We're called to do this in the Christian church. The Apostle Paul talks about this repeatedly. So that's, that's another thing that we're seeing here, what, what um, Jonathan is willing to do with David and David being struck to the heart by this. So it's kind of interesting. In some ways, David is a prophetic type for Jesus, but in other ways, Jonathan is. Oh, and I didn't tell you about the names. The names, um, David, David means beloved, okay? And it's Dalid, Yod, Dalid. And that is the same Hebrew lettering for the Hebrew word dod, which means beloved. So, so what happens is, uh, you get a stressor on the, the Vav that, that, uh, that, that, that takes you to David, okay? okay? So in other words, David's name means beloved. Let me ask you this, biblical scholars. How many other Davids do you have in the Old Testament? How many other Davids? Zero. 
there's something that's being said about the uniqueness of David that is also prophetic. It just sets him apart. Okay? Now, Jonathan, what does his name mean? Yah Natan. Yah is short for Yahweh, which is the name of the Lord, and Natan means gift. So Jonathan is God's gift. So you've got beloved and the Lord's gift. And those two things are brought together in this unique friendship between David and Jonathan. Again, it's, it's all a prophetic message about the preparation for the kingdom that is to come and about how we relate to Jesus. So it's really rich and deep stuff. So in other words, what I want to say, and if you're watching online, I hope you will get the message. Um, don't, you know, let's, let's move beyond kind of the simple, crass, and a kind of political, current political agenda reading of these passages and understand the deep, rich, good news message that God is bringing us through the story of Jonathan and David and more broadly about what it means to be a Christian, to be a person of faith, and to be a friend. As we'll talk about next time, Jesus is going to call us to be true friends of his and to understand that he is the ultimate friend. He's the ultimate beloved, and he's the ultimate gift from the Lord to us. But you know what? When we truly are faithful and justified and sanctified in Jesus, we're the Lord's gift to Jesus. So it's going to work both ways. Just keep that in mind. This is really exciting, deep, good news message, isn't it? The story of Jonathan and David. So I guess in a way it's good that we had this controversy before us so we can remember the deep truths of the Bible here. Good? Yeah? All right. Amen? Well, let's pray together. Lord, we come before you. We are so thankful for the goodness and the clarity of your word, for the opportunity, Lord, if we will open our hearts and minds and souls, not only to move past distractions with reading your word, but to begin by your Holy Spirit to receive the deep, saving, and eternal truths of your good news. Thank you, Jesus. And help us to grow and to learn about what it means to be your friend, your friends, and uh, through you, true friends with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, good. Good to be with you all.